very nice to be invited to come here and to participate in the organization, although I have to admit that actually Tommy's done most of it and Osa. So thank you to both for, for, for that. And I, I, um, I've not uh, really had uh, nearly as much to do. So I, I'm very grateful. Also, I have to start off um, with an apology, actually. And I apologize for not being somebody called Mikhail Hartline. Um, because uh, originally when we uh, planned this, um, uh, this presentation, we wanted to get an expert in molecular biology. And in my group, um, Mikhail uh, Hartline is that person. He is an outstanding molecular biologist and he uh, has um, much more insight into the molecular biology and the biochemistry of what we've been doing for the deuteration activities in my group. I'm actually a, a biophysicist and um, so I work, if you like, on the other side of, 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 of things. And um, But as Tommy said, I've been integrally involved in, in developing, developing this, proposing this facility and developing it over, um, well, you know, sort of nearly 20 years um, it's been going. And I think as a result, um, you know, lots of other facilities have, including in, in Lund, have, have started to put together facilities like this to support biology. Because in the end, um, there's, uh, the, if you don't use deuteration and you don't to make your samples, to optimize your samples, you, you very much narrow the gap between what you can do with x-rays and what you can do with neutrons. Um, if, without that, you know, you're, 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 you're not an awful lot ahead, ahead of um, or different from what you can do with an x-ray source. And of course, x-ray sources have huge advantages in their own right for intensity and, um, and beam size and all, all sorts of things. So um, it, was in, it was in the early 2000s really when uh, I proposed to build up a facility of this type for neutrons. Uh, and it actually met with quite a lot of opposition to be set up and, um, and it was all very complicated. So what I hope so what, I, what I'm not going to do is to tell you the molecular biology details of um, every deuteration method that we've developed and, and how they've been applied. I'm going to point out more uh, on the, the, the application side of, of deuteration and, and I, that will relate to different regimes for deuteration. Um, uh, but I'm not going to get uh, into the, the molecular biology that the, it'll become pretty obvious what organisms we use for expression um, uh, and some of the techniques are uh, quite complex, um, but uh, you'll, you'll get a rough idea of the, what's the sort of thing we do and uh, the, the way in which it applies, how it can be applied to, to neutron scattering of different types. Uh, and I, I, I I'm aware of the fact that uh, I may repeat, I will, I will try and I, I didn't watch all of um, Frank's lecture this morning, um, and I know Esco will have spoken already. Is that true? Uh, and um, I suppose I, 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 I may overlap accidentally um, a bit, so I apologise if that happens. But I'm trying not to go over stuff that I'm almost certain they will have told you. So uh, it'll be about what we do and, and, and some examples. So anyway, on on uh, uh, please yell if you want to ask a question or, or yell at Tommy or somebody because I don't mind stopping. We can talk for as long as we want. Um, uh, anyway, so this is our site. Many of you, I guess, will have been to it or will go to it um, at some time in, in the future. Obviously, ESS um, is being built and, uh, and will become functional. But until then, um, this is um, one of the best sources around, if not the best source. The, the, and that is the reactor that you see on the left of the, your screen here. It's, a, it's a, a European infrastructure. It's also a, an infrastructure to which Sweden subscribes. And as such, uh, it is entitled to apply for beam time there. And um, so it's something that, that you all either do or should be using or can use. Uh, and it's uh, adjacent to that, of course, is, uh, our, is the synchrotron. Uh, and uh, the synchrotron was not put there just because there was space. It was put there very, very specifically to co-locate so that the complementarity between the two capabilities, the x-rays and, and the neutrons could be fully exploited. Uh, also, the restaurant was not co-located by accident either. But anyway, so in between, um, 
the, 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 the those there is the EMVL outstation, which you'll see here. So I've actually got labels for these. There's the ILL, and here's the ESRF. And the IBS is off this picture. Unfortunately, I think they should retake it and get up the IBS in there as well. And then EMVL outstation. The EMVL outstation was actually built or installed um, as a relatively small thing in the early days of the ILL. Um, uh, ILL's operations uh, to support biology at the neutron source before the synchrotron even existed. And um, so, but it's been an important thing because without that, it's very difficult to do biology if you're not in close proximity to um, uh, good lab capabilities. And that's even more so true now than it was then. I mean, now there's all sorts of things you do with biology and biological systems that you couldn't do then when, when EML was first located there. And then of course the synchrotron came along and the EMBL became closely uh, connected to that. So EMBLs had a strong role in, in the biology on this site um, since its inception, since the ILL existed. Uh, and so there we are, that's that, those, and then we have formed partnerships. Now the partnerships actually uh, occurred um, because despite the fact that these things were co-located, it was very easy for the neutron people and the X-ray people to stay in their own corners and not to interact in the way that was um, officially hoped at the, at the beginning. And, uh, and that was why the Partnership for Structural Biology was built. That was built, the, uh, um, it was formed, the partnership was formed in the early 2000s. Uh, and uh, it has grown, so it's the, it's the oldest partnership and it's, it's become very, very strong, it's a very good um, partnership. And it was designed so that everybody um, was, uh, was, could share their own platforms, their own capabilities to optimize the science so that we were using more combined techniques and we were pushing more into interdisciplinarity and multi-technique approaches. And that has been extremely successful. That's this is the PSB, the symbolic center is right here in the circle. Uh, it's the main thing I'm going to talk about, which is why I made it green. Uh, and uh, it is a bolted on, if you like, to the, to the EMBL outstation. So you can just walk from one to the other. And it contains uh, mixed labs from ILL, ESRF and IBS and so on. And it has a very, very good um, atmosphere and lots of uh, students, young people, postdocs and, and so on, who are interacting on a, on a daily basis. A very, very nice atmosphere. Of course, that's the sort of thing that's being foreseen now, I think, for, for, for Lund. Uh, there is the, I, I, this is the closest I could come to, um, it's a very visually nice picture, um, but showing infrastructure developments um, and the ESS of the future, Max4 and so on. And, and the bit in between, which will be important uh, for forming a scientific culture and enabling a nice scientific culture and, and capabilities that, um, for the future. So, uh, but back to this, uh, if we sort of think back to zero, and I apologize if I'm going too far back to zero, um, uh, just to give, give you a sort of a, a, a visual uh, grasp of why we have these two capabilities. And again, I apologize if it's too simplistic, but at the synchrotron on the right, you've got um, you've got X-rays. So you've got X-rays, and X-rays are very good at seeing stuff uh, where you know the, where you've got large numbers of electrons, because obviously the X-rays are scattered from the electrons. So if you have more electrons, then you're going to have a, a more con more more visibility, and uh, uh, um, and the heavier your atoms, the more the stronger uh, the the images are. And of course, that immediately brings to mind um, the fact that uh, you have a fundamental problem there because the, what the, the element with the least number of electrons, which is hydrogen, has very little visibility, if any at all, in, in, even in, in high resolution studies. Um, so you have a problem right from the beginning in that you have hydrogen, which is one of the most important atoms in biology for reasons that will, I don't, won't even need to tell you, hydrogen bonding and specificity interactions and uh, ligand binding and all sorts of things. Um, uh, and you have very poor visibility and, and, and that's a problem yeah, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, and this is the story for the neutron, neutron equivalent of the same molecule, in fact. And you can see the difference, right? So you see, just looking at this left image, you see, 
The hydrogens are all there, uh, very clearly visible. You can see a hydroxyl group here. You can see the orientation of that hydroxyl group. You have no idea what it is in the X-ray case, and so on. So that's fundamentally it in a nutshell. You've got hydrogen. You've got you've got uh, um, a visibility of hydrogen that, uh, as deuterium, it, that is much um, stronger than you can get any other way. So you can get crystallographic information, for example, not just this local we We're going to talk about other things as well. Uh, and you can get this type of information um, in exactly the analogous way that you do with x-rays, but um, uh, there are a number of important consequences of using neutrons, and most of that comes down to samples. Sample, sample, sample. So you can build the best instrumentation in the world, and ILL has got the best instrumentation in the world, uh, but if you don't optimize your samples, you're not going to make the best science, whatever you do, however much uh, instrumentation you throw at it. So anyway, and here's more, 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 more uh, water. This is water. So your water, uh, look at, you can see your H's as well as the, the oxygen in the middle. You can see the, the hydrogens. This is high resolution neutron crystallography. And you can just see these amazing water molecules, which of course in, in X-ray crystallography, you just see as oxygen really. Um, so you get all that information, orientation of water molecules. You get um, information on protonation states or um, amino acid residue, you get all sorts of details that stuff that lies underneath the surface of, uh, of x-ray crystallography that you just don't see. So very often what we find, uh, if I just take the crystallographic angle as an example, very often what we find is that even when, um, uh, when you, you're, you're, you're looking at something and you don't really, uh, you think, for example, and I'll give you an example of this, you find things that you're just not expecting. And that are not even were not even part of what your proposal aimed to find. You just find stuff that's appearing because uh, you can suddenly see new things, and um, that's there's been a lot of that uh, in, in neutron biology work over the years. And this is an example, actually. Uh, this is rubridoxin, which is a redox protein um, um, which shifts electrons around. If it's a redox protein, it's, it's dealing with electrons, and obviously, you're dealing with electrons. You're also dealing with protons because you know. Uh, absence of charge and so on. Um, so it's shunting charge around. Um, so, but the reason we actually did this study was I said to um, a postdoc, I said, what would be really good would be to have a standard sample, a standard biological sample. Uh, what would be a nice, easy one to do? And, uh, and we ended up deciding on rubidoxin because it, it's a nice standard system. And, um, and you can grow large crystals. So I, my feeling was just have a standard biological sample. We put it on the tractometer. You can put it, take it on, take it off for all sorts of good reasons that would help us um, on, the, on the instrument and so on, on the, on the, on the diffractometer. And, but then when we actually looked at it, you can see what we're finding. We're finding here, for example, top right, you, that's a hydronium ion, right? So you couldn't see that with x-rays. You, you couldn't distinguish a water, a hydro, hydronium, or, or even uh, you know, uh, an OH, so you, you can't actually distinguish between them. So what we were finding is hydronium, which of course is charged. Uh, and um, what we found was a very, very detailed, here's water, right, very clear orientation of the water. And what we found were networks of hydronium and water that actually formed complex chemical species that I'd never even thought about in my life called uh, zundel ions, uh, which are complex. So you can see them down here, that's a zundel ion. Right, uh, it's a complex, you know, complex, uh, it's a complex ion, if you like. Uh, so that's just to show that sometimes, well, it reminds us all that, that science, there's, there's the stuff that you um, know you don't know, and then there's the stuff that you don't know you don't know. Uh, and, um, and sometimes that can be the most interesting uh, of all. So that's just one example, um, x-rays, neutrons, looking at them together. and. This, of course, is, uh, is this is called the, uh, it's a visual representation of the Grotus mechanism, showing how um, conductivity is trying to explain the conductivity of water, shunting protons um, uh, across uh, tunneling. I mean, uh, char char charged tunneling um, in, in in a water network, um, and it was proposed, as I said, to to as an explanation in around 1800 to for the conductivity of water and that's from this type of study is exactly the sort of thing it makes you think of. Um, 
So anyway, so there we go, a few examples there. This is uh, partnership building. This is, of course, it has the usual mandatory right-handed helix uh, as a fire escape, which uh, uh, is, is always reassuring. And, um, and these are, we have lots and lots of PhD students all interacting um, and um, a lot of um, formal and informal um, activities and so on. So it's a very fertile environment and I imagine that's what everybody is hoping will build up um, um, in, 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 as the ESS Max4 developments and the village in between them starts to, to, to grow. So um, yeah, so of course what we're doing these days is um, we're trying to build the most interesting action is actually uh, whether you look at it in terms of disciplines or uh, length scales, it's in the gaps. Uh, it's the bits in between, the bits in between biology and physics, the bits in between, um, uh, you know, the, the length scales. I mean, if you look at it, if you think of it, if you stand back a bit, then you, you think that, uh, you know, we're quite good at molecular things. We can do crystallography, we can do solution scatter, we can do all sorts of things at a molecular level, and we get lots of, um, not enough, but we get. Uh, Lots of stuff that's going on there, and then at the other end, we've got organism, organs, tissues. We're quite good there. We can light microscopy and all sorts of uh, different microscopies, uh, and then, it, but then there's a gap between the molecular level length scale and and the cellular structural biology, and that's a big important gap where lots of things are changing because microscopy is changing a lot, and 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 I think this is where we realise. Uh, that we, and this is what's happened really in the last sort of uh, five years or more, um, that there's been a huge uh, shift in emphasis uh, away from the classical structural biology, which was largely x-rays um, until quite recently. Um, um, and it, that has now shifted uh, so to, to multi-technique approaches in integrated integrated structural biology, if you like, is the, is the latest phrase, and lots of things are going on there um all the time so so it's it's a very very rapidly moving field now and all at a time of course when the biotechnology the ability to produce proteins express them and use organisms to produce molecules is also growing uh, at an amazing rate so it's a very exciting time um so uh and, and of course if you think about it biomedically um another important gap is between the molecular level biosciences where people looking at and drug interactions and all sorts of things uh, and clinical research there's a big gap there as well so um, it's in fundamental biology but it's also in in the gaps between um, um, clinical and um, molecular studies so if I come back to uh, to us uh, and um, uh, and look at the type of capabilities we have access to on a routine basis they sort of can be broken up into three areas um, there's a sample preparation ones on the left there, there's characterization, characterization techniques, uh, and, and then there's the sort of big, bigger machines, the, the structure and dynamics um, capabilities, the neutrons, the x-rays, the I-field NMR, electron microscopy, and so on. And of course, as everybody knows, the uh, electron microscopy has, has made huge developments over the last um, um, three, four, five years, and there's been, uh, there are amazing things happening there. But we have to, and, and that is actually affecting um, the, the scope of, of X-ray methods. I, I, I think that's true because some of the, the, um, the larger systems are now been doing rather routinely at 100K in these machines. Uh, and um, in, in an area that actually the X-rays were dealing with up until that point. Uh, so, so the two techniques are sort of overlapping and, and I guess everything's shifting around a little bit to accommodate that. But relatively little has, the con the, there's been relatively few consequences of that development for uh, neutrons because we still, um, you know, you still got the same problems. You still got the, the hydrogen problem. You still got um, so so that that, that that sort of emphasizes um, the fact that the neutrons uh, really are still as relevant as before, uh, even despite this development. So. Anyway, so, so uh, amongst these platforms, the ones that are relevant to the neutrons are the ones I've highlighted here in green. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the neutron, the deuteration laboratories in my group, which is a life sciences group. 
so we have that platform. We operate that platform as a user platform. You, any of you can apply to use it. You can write a proposal saying you want this two phase or that two phase or something. Uh, we try to, we have an interest in, in large fiscal growth. Um, and uh, yeah, and on, on, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the Big machine side of things, we've got obviously neutron. We've got three, four diffractometers that can do neutron crystallography. Um, some of them allow e machines. Two of them allow e machines now. One, one is monochromatic, uh, and and so on. So we've got, uh, and of course we've got SACS and SANS. We've got reflection. I haven't put reflection there, but there's reflectometry. You probably will be hearing a lot about that um, in, in, if you haven't already. Uh, so. Uh, those are the, those are some of the platforms, and it's important to realise. I think it's it's very important to realise uh, um, that uh, that that these things develop. You know, it's not as though and um, the biologists say, "Hey, we've got this problem. We need to have this technique." That's not the way it works. It, it, I mean, the the, um, the the initial days of neutron work. Um, actually, biology wasn't the centre stage. It was important, but not centre stage. Uh, and sometimes capabilities emerge because technology has developed. So it's a two-way process. And that's a very important uh, thing to remember uh, in the context of service institutes uh, where these developments are pushed very heavily and effectively by people who run beam lines and who work their feet, who, who run their feet off and who work their socks off in making these developments. So I think it's, all, it's, it's important for your future career to know uh, how important those developments are, and how in, how um, how uh, how much effort goes into that, and and, and to um, always to remember it in the background. Um, so anyway, uh, this is the PSD. This is the, our last external review. Um, there will be another one shortly. Um, those are the number of publications that came out of it. The number that were multi-institute is quite high, and the impact factor is all quite high as well. So it's a it's a good. Um, it's a good collaboration between all these things. And, um, you know, those pictures are just supposed to uh, highlight uh, the different organisms that are used in producing um, uh, the, the different proteins and so on that, that we, we do. Uh, now, for duration, uh, there's a review I think I, I sent around that uh, you may have seen. Um, and this is one of the pictures from it, I think. I think we used this. Um, and the, the review, um, it was Methods of Enzymology, it was by Mikhail Hartline and, and, and the rest of us, or some of us. And um, we, uh, one of the things that was in it, I think, was this sort of scheme whereby we highlight different types of labeling that you might want to do. Um, so the blue is supposed to show unlabeled. Uh, you could say hydrogenated if you like, um, but in actual fact, strictly speaking, um, it's natural abundance because even natural abundance, even the sort of, uh, uh, there's always a very small fraction of deuterium uh, and uh, in, in normal life, uh, whatever it is, 0.2% or whatever it is. Uh, so natural abundance is a better term. Uh, you can change the blue all to yellow where you completely replace all of the hydrogens in your protein uh, by deuterium uh, and then we have had, we have named a category of deuteration match out deuteration, which is what we call when in solution scattering the overall scattering length density, which I'm sure Frank told you about, uh, if you didn't already know, matches that of 100% uh, uh, D12. Okay, so that's the point at which, if you're talking about contrast variation, you put your protein in there. If it's match out deuterated, it's invisible. Now, you might think, well, that's a silly thing to do, but in actual fact, if it's a complex and one bit is visible and the other bit is invisible, then you've got a tool that you can use in all sorts of nice ways. So match out deuterated, purge deuterated. Now, I, I say purge deuterated, um, you know, uh, that, that's what you want uh, for crystallography, typically, for neutron crystallography, because you replaced all the hydrogens um, by deuteriums. What happens then is that the, you get a, a massive decrease, as you'll see in a minute, uh, in, in incoherent scattering, hydrogen incoherent scattering, uh, which gives you much better signal to noise in the crystallographic data that you can measure. Uh, and it has a, a whole lot of other benefits as well. But basically, it gives you this improved visibility, which means that you can get to smaller samples. And of course, samples are the big problem here because, in contrast to X ray work, where you can study a crystal if it's five microns, 
uh, or less, um, you need huge, huge crystals. So anything that improves the visibility means that you can use smaller crystals, and that means you can widen the scope uh, of things. So, and then there's all sorts of different things, right? There's um, so one of the most interesting is segmental deuteration, where you pick out a particular part of the protein and you label that in some clever way. Uh, you can replace all of the um, particular types of amino acids by deuterium analog. We've done that as well. That can be useful. And so on. So th th this is a summary of the regimes that you might want to do um, to use um, uh, in terms of the deuteration capabilities that we are involved in. And uh, these, as this is repeating the previous slides on, on the different expression systems that you can think of, the different ways of produce, producing these molecules. Uh, we do lots and lots of bacterial expression systems, or this is rather standard now. Um, it wasn't when we started, but it, it's rather standard now. Yeast, of course, as well. Cell free also, um, and we do peptide synthesis as well, um, and, uh, and so on. The, the ones that we are most interested in now in developing. Um, are mammalian cell systems because if you think about, especially everybody's more increasingly aware of, of, of it now with the pandemic, but, but if you just take examples of, let's say, the spike protein of the virus, of COVID-19 virus, or, or adenovirus, or any of these um, virus, spherical viruses, um, then the spikes are the thing that interact with the host. Uh, so those interactions are very interesting to study and to know about and to fundamentally and, and, and biomedically, um, but they're all glycosylated proteins. So you, you, they're decorated with particular patterns of, of sugars, which of course, uh, it doesn't really happen. Um, uh, in the, if, you, if you take a protein, you can produce a spike protein bacteria and it won't be glycosylated. And as such, I don't know what that means in terms of the information provided for, uh, for, for the biology. Um, so the glycosylation patterns are very important, uh, which is not, really something that glycosylation is not something that, that that's friendly to for physiography it's more a solution thing or maybe be a reflection thing or perhaps dynamics um but there, it is important because uh it relates to uh folding uh and it's important that you have the if you if you, if you produce it in for example insects you get different glycosylation patterns you could expect so you actually want to be working in the in the same system or producing your proteins in the same system as the, as the system of interest biologically. So, but they're much harder to, to deuterate, but we're starting now a program of work on, 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 on um, trying to develop mammalian cell deuteration. And I might come back to that later. So anyway, I'm probably going on a little bit too long. We, you will have seen this picture. I assume it's true, is it, Tommy, that this, is, this picture has been seen from, yeah, okay. So, okay, so you know about this, all right? This is um, uh, natural contrast. Um, uh, if we have no deuteration, right? So you can see, um, you know, the match out is it, this is the scattering length density of water as you go from 0% to 100. And at various points, uh, you sort of interact, you, you cross the lines for phospholipid or hydrogenated protein in uh, DNA and so on. And then up here, uh, I say no deuteration, but up here I have budget. There's 100% deuteration and match out labels protein uh, and match out. It, as I said before, matches out at 100% D2O, whereas fully deuterate protein goes is not matchable. You go, it's too, it's too far gone. It's too deuterated, so you can't match it up. Uh, that, that's uh, that's not necessarily uh, um, a problem. But you, it's just it's just the way it is. And but anyway, so in terms of no deuteration, if you don't have deuteration, then take you can look at a nucleic acid protein complex, for example. You can. Um, without any deuteration whatsoever, you can make one bit appear uh, in, invisible and the other bit highlight it um, by choosing different, um, you know, by choosing that particular contrast. Uh, or you can make the other bit go, um, uh, go invisible and see the first bit. So you're then able to look at um, different parts of, of, in this case, a nucleic acid protein complex in solution, um, uh, which of course is actually you know you think about it this not the crystalline world is not the biological world it provides huge information in all sorts of different ways but it's not the biological world um the solution state you might think is, is more relevant biologically but even that we, you've got to accept we have an experimental method and we live we work within the constraints of our methods and 
even the solution state is not perfectly biological because uh, biological systems are much more concentrated than even the most concentrated systems we tend to look at um, uh, in, in our experiments. But then all, all experiments have their limitations. If it's cryo-electron microscopy, you're working at 100K, that's not very natural either. So the relevance of all of these things comes mostly when you put them all together and alongside each other so that you, uh, you get a collective picture, which you see with different methods, and then you say, yeah, okay, I believe it. And um, so there, uh, and then the same sort of arguments for seeing proteins in, in lipid bilayers, either in my, in my, cell, my cells or in uh, my cellular systems or in, um, or in, um, uh, or in, in planar, planar samples. Uh, and I use this, this is something we developed um, with, um, uh, actually with Lisa Arliss group and somebody called Selma Merrick, who was a student, uh, who, who she's now at Max4. She, she worked jointly between us and Lisa Arliss in Copenhagen for her PhD. And she developed this thing called stealth nanodisc, and you, you'll see what's meant by that. So these are, this is at the top right, you see there's all, these are membrane proteins or cartoons of membrane proteins. And the idea is to show um, how important they are. Transport, uh, enzymatic activity, signal transduction, neurotrain transmitters, for example, attachment, uh, cellular joining, recognition, and so on. So it's a huge amount of importance um, in, um, in, in membrane proteins, and they're also quite difficult to look at um, because they just are. They're difficult to crystallize and, and they're difficult to study. Um, so what we just, there was a, a development um, by Sligar um, uh, a while ago where he developed th these things called nanodisks uh, where he could um, sort of contain um, uh, a protein within a, a, a small bilayer sandwich, uh, which was wrapped, contained by, by a belt protein around the outside, right? So that was, there were all sorts of reasons why that was an advantage. But when we looked at that, uh, um, we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could come up with a deuteration regime that would make um, everything invisible apart from the protein of interest? Uh, in other words, if you could make it go like that. And then you could just use standard solution scattering type methods to look at that protein in its natural context um, uh, uh, by just using solution scattering. So that what we so that's why Selma called them stealth nanodisks, uh, um, because they one part of it just sort of turns invisible, and of course there's a there's a there's, a, there's an airplane called a stealth um, a stealth jet which goes around pretending to be invisible. I'm sure it's not invisible but anyway. But, but so so this is what Selma did. Uh, she here is the, the nanodisk. Uh, and it hasn't got a protein in it, but here's the nanodisc. It's got the belt protein, it's got the lipid in the middle. And uh, with the ones that she made, you, this is supposed to represent e increasing concentrations of D2O uh, going from left to right, so that finally at 100%, they're invisible. That's what she did, and, uh, and that's where it was published. And since then, it's been used, uh, and that's the, the aircraft that I was referring to, and it's supposed to be invisible as well, and that's why she called it that. And there's a few examples here of, of how, um, how it's been used for uh, a transporter, mem integral membrane protein, M MSBA, embedded in, in one of these nanodisks. Nanodisk invisible, just see the protein. And we're doing a lot of this now. And actually, we're hooking, hooking up with the electron microscopy people with it, with our electron we're working with our electron microscopy people to um, to put these together the solution state structures and the uh, and, and the cryo electron microscopy which of course is at very much higher resolution but uh, is uh, at 100k uh, and you're not going to see transitions going on there uh, and uh, seeing the whole things um, working together with both methods is, is, is infinitely preferable. So this is some of the same system with the cryo-electron microscopy. These are the different uh, classes. This is some of the raw data there at the top, and then some of the classes derived from that, 2D classes that are derived from that, and, um, and, and then the structure itself. So, uh, so there's, a, there's a very interesting sort of move, move there for developing that sort of complementarity uh, along with the cryo-electron microscopy. Um, 
Now, and uh, here's another example. So we, uh, cholesterol, cholesterol is, is one of the most important lipids for in biological biomedicine, if you like. Um, we all know about cholesterol. We know about high density lipoproteins. We know about uh, low density lipoproteins. We know about the health issues associated with, with that. And, but the problem has always been for, in terms of studying this, is, is that cholesterol as a lipid is basically indistinguishable from all of the other lipids that it is immersed in and, 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 and functions alongside. Uh, so you can't actually see it. So what this describes is a de development that we made where we um, took a metabolically engineered strain um, uh, of Pisha and to, in order to um, uh, perturbate the cholesterol so that we could see it uh, with high contrast alongside all the other lipids in, in, a, in a system. So uh, this is a sort of a summary of the metabolically engineered yeast um, that was designed to produce this cholesterol. Um, uh, it, basically, the system was, was engineered to produce cholesterol instead of ergosterol, which is what it normally does. Um, and of course, we all know the importance of these things. There's a, there's a um, you know, cholesterol, atherosclerosis, all these things. There's a, there's a huge interest in, in what cholesterol is doing, and not least in some of the vaccines that are being made for mRNA delivery um, uh, to, uh, as part of the vaccine programs that we all know about in, in the news. And uh, anyway, so there's some, some examples there where you, you, can, you can start to get really reliable modeling information on what cholesterol is doing in, in lipid systems and, uh, and in, in, um, uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in the proteins that are embedded in membranes. So that, that's a really nice development. Again, innovation uh, for duration. We've got a, so if a single lesson that comes out of all of this, it's just that you just have to keep innovating for, for your samples. And that's always been the case for every technique. But it's, it's sometimes the case, I think, that people just think, oh, well, we can, we've got duration laboratories. Uh, that's great. You know, um, we don't need to invest in them anymore because it's all done. You know, it's, it, it's a naive argument. You just, it's never all done because uh, you're, it's a living subject and things are changing all, all the time. Um, it's a bit like when they were sort of saying in, 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 the, in, the, in the 90s, the politicians were sort of saying, well, physics, it's all done, right? You know, what else is there to learn? Uh, you don't need physics departments. You, you, uh, you know, you, you can do it. You, you should focus on the applications and, and so on. But that's also very shallow. So uh, politicians sometimes get into this situation. So cholesterol has become a very um, important tool and it, it's producing very exciting stuff. Uh, and lots and lots of published stuff has come out of out of this. Um, uh, use it and, and using our cholesterol, and some people, other people are now producing cholesterol as well in, in Australia and elsewhere. So uh, yeah, so those are now right. We get back to crystallography. I started with crystallography, and I'm going to end uh, with an example from crystallography, mostly because it's one I'm very interested in myself. Uh, so it's slightly selfish, but there's the crystallography. I, there's blue, your, your protein, it's hydrogenated blue. Um, and, um, and what you see in the diffraction pattern, which is, uh, there's a monochromatic diffraction pattern just to its right here in the middle, is you see the spots, of course, from the diffraction, but you can also see this dark background. Um, and that dark background comes from uh, what I remember Frank, you know, in, 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 his, uh, in his, the early part of his lecture, he talked about incoherent scattering. Hydrogen incoherent scattering. Hydrogen has two spin states. For those of you who who did who who, who remember you know, uh, fermions and bosons and stuff, that it has two spin states up and down. Deuterium only has a single spin state, and as a result, you in deuterium in the case of deuterium you have no incoherent scattering, and in the case of hydrogen you have a lot of incoherent scattering from the two spin states of hydrogen, and that contributes a background, uh, a gray background, and it restricts the accuracy with which you can measure these spots, uh, both where they are and their intensities. So just to illustrate what happens when you deuterate um, or crystallography, uh, you turn it all to yellow. I think it was yellow, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, right. So it, it, it goes yellow, uh, you put it into D2O solvent, and you're, you get a huge improvement in the visibility of the spots. Uh, and that means you're going to measure them all better. It means the quality goes up. And it means, in fact, that you can use smaller samples. 
um, because you gain in signal to noise, it means you, you can compromise a bit. So that typically ends up with a gain of about 10, it's always estimated to be about 10 in, in, um, in the crystal volumes that are needed. Um, there, are, there is also, um, I think Frank mentioned this uh, as well, uh, he would have measured, he probably would have um, mentioned that hydrogen has a negative scattering length. Now the reasons for that, we don't really need to go into, you probably were told anyway, but hydrogen has a negative, so when you have a hydrogen atom, it appears in, in density maps as a negative peak. Um, and there are situations where the negative peak can start to cancel out some of the surrounding um, positive peaks from the rest of the structure. So you have these so-called density cancellation effects that tend to interfere with the interpretation of, of, um, of, of, the, um, of the maps. And um, whereas if it's all deuterium, then you get this huge visibility, which is, I, I showed you before in, in these maps, you, you see these strong peaks um, and so on. And there are other advantages as well, like you get, you avoid nasty absorption effects um, uh, and so on. So, so that's, that's the duration of crystallography. You want nothing, you want no hydrogen left at all. Ideally, you just want 100% D. You don't want any hydrogen anywhere. Uh, that's the ideal world. And of course, you have to be careful because uh, we have to be wary of of um, of um, isotope effects, and um, we have to be careful to know that uh, the structures that we're looking at in deuterated de form are actually reflecting the real molecule. And typically, we do that with X-ray. You take the D form, you take the H form, you do the crystallographic study uh, side by side, and you say what's different. It, it, and, and the same would be true for solution work as well. And there are isotope effects. You just have to be aware of it. You have to. Uh, do all the relevant tests uh, to make sure that you're not a victim of it uh, and that you benefit mostly. So anyway, that's the now uh, the one I wanted to the, the example I wanted to show you in relation to this is about actually it's about amyloid genesis. It's in in a particular protein called transtyretin, uh, and I love this example because it's got it's got all sorts of different combinations of different techniques as well as of how, having had being lucky enough to have work with some amazing people in doing it. Um, so transtyretin is the protein um, that transports um, thyroxin in, 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 in a, it is an important hormone around in the bloodstream and in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And uh, I, there's a little movie I've been using for a little while now, uh, for those of you who don't really know about transtyretin or amyloid or anything. Uh, so this is a human being, obviously, um, and um, uh, this is, an attempt to summarize. Um, oh, it doesn't look as though the movie's working. That's brilliant. Uh, right, the movie's not working. All right. Anyway, so I'll, I'll attempt to um, to to. Um, that's amazing. Um, maybe it's the arrow here. Really annoying. Okay, I apologize. My movie has not worked. Um, so anyway, so that the 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 trans the, the transtyretin is produced mostly in the liver. And um, and it's a tetramer. It, it's a I don't know what my next slide is. Then say oh my goodness. Uh, so it, it, it's a tetramer. So it's a four. It's a four. It's got four bits to it, and it has a cavity in the middle, which is where the natural ligand, the thyroxine, binds. And 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 it and and it circulates around uh, and delivering and, and transporting uh, um, thyroxine. So it is obviously very important for the endocrine system. And um, but the problem with it is, is that the tetramer is intrinsically unstable um, and, um, uh, and, and it tends to fall apart. And when it falls apart, it, it sort of falls apart and it reassembles as, as a fibrillar system uh, and, uh, and forms these, these, these amyloid packs, which uh, in, in the case we've been looking at um, occur mostly in the heart, but they can affect the brain, they can affect the uh, it cause neuropathy, it can get into the intestine, all sorts of places. They, there's all sorts of different mutants that go into different places, even though the mutants are very subtle, single point mutations can end up with, with these things accumulating in, in very specific ways in different tissues. So, so, so it, that alone is quite amazing. And just to give you a feeling for that, I apologize about the movie again. This is a, uh, our collaborator at UCL, a picture from him. Um, he, he, he had a patient, this guy, Mark Pepys, who, who he had a patient who, um, one of his patients was, was had cardiac, um, um, cardiomyopathy from amyloid. And uh, in the end, I think she, um, 
had she had a heart transplant um, and uh, this is he took a picture of the heart as it uh, you know after it came out uh, and you can sort of see um, from this picture and from the other pictures here the restrictive nature of the amyloid deposits if you look at that heart you can it, it, it literally looks as though it would bounce if you dropped it it's hard it's not flexible it's very restricted in what its function is capable of doing so uh, that's just to give you a feeling for the real clinical um, consequences of amyloid accumulation in amyloid cardiomyopathy. And of course, it's the same in other tissues as well. It's just that you really, it really is evocative. It really does sort of stand out um, um, in the way that you understand it when you just imagine how, how much it restricts movement and pumping. So anyway, so here's the molecule. It's a tetram, as I said, uh, for or bits to it, the cavity in the middle, which is where the ligand would go. Uh, so the monomer, you can see the monomer, you can see it, it has a dimer, and then of course there's a dimer of the dimer, which makes the tetramer. And what we did, um, this is the same sort of summary. Um, uh, so there's the binding pocket, the different parts of the, of the tetramer and so on. And what we did was, I get, this won't work either, I, bet, I guess. No, it's not working. That's supposed to be a movie as well. This is a list of, uh, single, mostly single point mutations of transthyretin, which result in um, all sorts of different um, mutations. So this is the, the, the reported phenotype in this column here. So um, polyneuropathy, I guess is PN, H means heart. So specific single mutations end up with the transthyretin consequences uh, for pathology being very discrete or, more, uh, or amazingly discrete. So, we were mostly interested in, that's the key, so it affects eye, heart, kidney, different mutations, uh, wild type, and some of the mutations are actually positive, right? So they're protective, but there's one mutation that is actually highly protective and it, uh, it prevents the thing, um, um, misfolding, forming amyloid. So that's a, for us, that's a very important reference in, in looking at the results from the more interesting pathological ones. Uh, and so, so what we decided to do was um, uh, was to look firstly at a highly protective mutant, and that's the T119M. I don't know where the M's gone, but anyway. Uh, so, and then there's an SF2P, that was the, the strongly pathological one. So highly protective, strongly pathological, and then the strongly pathological one bound with a drug that was that is that is the only drug actually around um, that is prescribed for it, that is approved for, for this. Uh, and so you can see the drug sitting in the middle of the structure there. So what we wanted to do was compare all these things uh, and to, to see uh, if there were any clues in making that comparison. And we, we realized that there's a lot of X-ray information um, around um, at the time, uh, uh, but it hadn't given the answers. So we thought we would do it with neutrons because we thought there's a strong chance that there would be a lot of stuff happening, as I said, under the surface of the X-ray work. That would that could be interesting, and it turned out to be exactly the same. So there's the stable mutant, the point mutation. This is the one for the unstable mutant, uh, and so just to give you a feeling for in vitro uh, what happens. So and I would just con concentrate. We've got all sorts of things: denaturing gels, non-denaturing gels, and, and and here. But if you just uh, compare, look at the right-hand um, row uh, uh, column uh, and the, this one in the middle, and don't worry too much about the other. So it's basically one of the very unstable mutants, which we call a duplication mutant, but one of them. Uh, and uh, this one, this column relates to the um, stable mutant. And uh, and what's happened here is that day zero, it, they've just been um, left. Uh, we've got various things we're, we're left at one. We've got a, a, some stuff left at four degrees, which is and then some stuff left at thirty-seven degrees. And we've got electro, electron micrographs at various stages along that pathway. So if you look at a protective mutant, for example, uh, along this column, you see absolutely nothing changes throughout the whole period of that experiment. Whereas if you look at the um, pathological mutant here, uh, uh, which uh, the D means it's deuterated, but uh, you uh, come back to that. So, and you just see these things just accumulating these, these deposits. And then at the very bottom, we've got what happens at four degrees, which is largely just there is some evidence of of, of, uh, of formation, but obviously much reduced, which is what you'd expect. 
Uh, and then here, the H and the D are just comparing the hydrogenated and the deuterated analogs of the same protein. I'm not going to go into the into the gels, but they're also very interesting because um, uh, I think I'm running a bit on time. Anyway, so so uh, so that just shows you a little bit about what in vitro what you see and what it is that's clogging up that heart um, and and stopping it, uh, it moving. Uh, and then when you actually do the, the neutron crystallography, uh, you, what you find is it, it's nothing short of amazing, really, um, because uh, what happens is you, uh, you, you have this mutation, uh, you have the, this is the protective mutant here, and you see you've got a hydrogen bond here, uh, which, uh, which, which, is, which actually has a huge effect on the stability of this loop of, of one particular part of the protein. And in the, in the mutation, it's, you've got that hydrogen bond is lost and you end up with a loosening of this uh, turn in the loop, which then loosens the entire loop um, um, and renders it um, much more unstable. One hydrogen bond, that's what's going on, it seems. And when you, do, oh, right, okay, this was another movie. This is really annoying. Anyway, uh, that should have started. Uh, anyway, so, so, um, oops. Um, so anyway, what that was designed to show you, it showed the molecular dynamics calculations for the monomer alone, the dimer alone, and the tetramer alone. And what you would see if it worked, it would be that the monomer alone would fall apart much more quickly than the dimer, which in turn would fall apart more quickly than the tetramer. So the tetramer forms a very important part in stabilizing, in stabilizing and falling, the monomer falling apart. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the constraining factor, if you like, um, um, so, and then there's some principal component analysis that shows the, this is the loop in question, where it's marked red, where it's most mobile. And uh, that is basically graphically showing the bit of the protein that is most unstable and that is at the heart of the problem. So, and then this is where the drug goes. And what you see is the drug pops into this area of, of the structure. It recruits a water molecule. And in the end, the most amazing thing is that it, this is the unstable mutant with the drug. Uh, it recruits this water molecule into this place, and in doing so, makes it look almost exactly like the stable mutant. So it's doing something closely analogous to that. It's not the end of the story because the drug is not actually universally successful. It, 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 does, it sometimes that doesn't work, but there's a very interesting insight there, and, and it became a, 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 an important part of, of the story. Uh, so uh, we get back to, I'm going to finish off really about linking gap, gaps uh, as well. And, and for this particular project, uh, we are linking up with uh, colleagues at, uh, in London, the Royal Free. Uh, um, I mentioned one of them already. And, and um, <coughs> uh, what we are doing is trying to uh, look at different mutants um, to identify and to, with the stuff that we produce in the lab in vitro and the same mutants from patients uh, and the proteins that are purified because we want to try to link things up and try to make them uh, so that we actually know that the experimental stuff at the bench is, is relevant and, and linked to real clinical issues. So, so that, that's going on. And we're also looking at different drugs because the only one that exists is not universally applicable. And uh, we're looking at different candidate drugs. This is some of them, the X-ray structures are some of them. We're preparing neutron experiments as well. Uh, that, for example, at the bottom, that's one of the drugs in, uh, binding both parts of the structure. So it's going right across the entire tetrama, whereas the other drug so far is actually uh, linked in one site, one side of the molecule, not both. Uh, and yeah, so, so that's where we are. And I'm going to finish with this slide. It's old, but that's, I'm blaming the uh, lockdown for not having a recent picture of it. This is 2018 or 19, I can't remember. Um, so, because they've done um, a huge amount of the work in developing the facilities and the group that we've got, which is um, actually a rather lovely group, and um, uh, and it has enabled. Uh, and then Dauda here, he came after this picture. He's the electron microscopy guy. He runs he runs the cryos with some other colleagues, and um, I think that's all I've got. Uh, some of the funders. Um, so I'll stop there, and if there's time. Anybody can ask me questions and um, I'm happy to try and answer. So do we have any questions for Trevor here? I have 
question. Yeah. Uh, can we go back to the contrast figure? Um, and there are different proportion of different protein. And right. Sorry, you're talking about one of the early slides? Yes. Uh, okay, let's just try. I don't know, uh, uh, there are many lines, and then there is a cross of a different proportion of. Uh, different the, the one, that's one. one yeah, that's back, one. back to the, the one, uh, the classical one. Yeah. So if you go back to our. Oh, sorry. Oh, this oh, was one the, uh, with a. Uh, where have I gone? Uh, I'm getting lost. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. That one she wants to ask her. Yeah. I want to ask um, if you have different deuterated protein, but uh, what about the solution, the solvent? I mean, how can you control, like, um, in the like zero percent on um, deuterated protein, then you need to put it into H2O. 100% deuterated protein, you need to put it into D2O. Then how can you do like 50% deuterated protein? Uh, because there are some hydrogens will will like interact with the solvent and then- Yes, absolutely. But you, what you have to do is relate, uh, relate the exchange to the exchange to the situation that you're aiming for. So in the end, uh, Basically, we in forming uh, recipes for making match out recipe, match out proteins, uh, you you just have to aim for zero contrast. So you adjust your adjust your conditions, and we have a protocol for doing this uh, so that the thing matches out at um, at one hundred percent. So even though there is a labile part of, as you say, the solvent, uh, there is a labile part of it. Okay, so by label different proportion of protein, we can see different protein in the same because uh, yes I, I guess so uh, I, I I hope I'm understanding you correctly um yes you can label I mean this is all statistically random right uh, the, the, the 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 degree of and it's the only reason it works is because you're at you're at it's solution scattering you're at low resolution you're at sort of 20 angstroms resolution or something uh, if you was higher resolution then you would be suffering the um the um the, the problems that uh, you know, where you, you couldn't really assume an average scattering length density um, uh, if you were at much higher resolution. Is that what you meant? Yeah, thank you. There is from uh, Susanna. You have a question? Um, yeah, but actually Jennifer was before me. Oh, uh, was he? I uh, bet go ahead. Okay. Jennifer can wait. She has asked so much now. <laughs> yeah, so go ahead. Yes, so thank you for this presentation. So I have actually two questions. So first one is about the segmental deuteration or just labeling. Are you, like, do you have a service for this? Uh, actually, the segmental is something, I don't know if Frank, did, did Frank refer to it in his book? Because he's actually done it. Uh, <laughs> he's done, we haven't done it enormously. We've, we've looked at it a lot in um, terms of uh, we thought, originally started talking to Mikhail Sattler about it because uh, he, he'd done it a little bit, I think it was in team technology that he used for that. Mm -hmm. And But we've since sort of uh, been thinking more about sautés. We haven't developed that as a routine, as a routine uh, service, but it is, it is definitely something that we'd like to do more of. Frank did it with Mikhail Sattler uh, and it benefited, I think he, he might have even referred to, because he had one paper um, where he, he used it. Um, but yeah, you're... you're is that what you meant? Sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, because I know that, yeah, they use the sortase A. Yes. There's also something called butylase one. Right. Okay. Uh, right. That, that's something I would refer to Mikhail Hartline uh, mm. about. But uh, I just remember that we, we started off thinking with it about in teams, and, and, and then we ended up feeling that the sortase approach was better. But it, it's actually a little bit, it's quite fiddly. Um, but it's certainly something we could talk about um, um, because it is a development we'd like to undertake. Yeah, I mean, I would be interested in this as well. So um, also for NMR. Yes, then, yes. Actually, I mean, a lot of these tricks uh, derive from NMR. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. I, I guess I mean, the reason Mikhail Sato was considering it, he's an NMR person. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so that's probably exactly why where it came from. Um, so yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and then my second question. So how far did you go with titration using insect cells? Oh, and, well, yeah. no, I mean, both, of, in, both insects and mammalian cells are, we, we, we meant to get going with in, in so we haven't done them, we're, we're, but we've jumped to mammalian because really it's more relevant to most of the biological problems. The insect cells, of course, are quite fragile, uh, and um, so they're, they're difficult. But then mammalian cells are as well, I and mean, we basically just jumped straight to mammalian cells, uh, and we've only just started on that. Um, and it's not going to be trivial. There's, it's very unlikely we're going to. There are some amazing developments around that. Uh, that but it's very unlikely we're going to be able to get to 100% utilization of mammalian cells. So I think what we will be, end up doing, you, know, you don't need to get to 100. Well, the solution scattering, you don't need to get to 100. You just need to get to some level where you have good contrast. Uh, so even if you get a contrast difference that amounts to, I don't know, 30% uh, solvent, um, then that's exploitable. Um, uh, and, uh, but there, it, it's very unlikely that we're going to get to something with extremely high levels of of deuteration with mammalian cells. Um, so we realize that, but you then got to come up with different um, uh, match out regimes and how you're going to use it and work out all the contrasts and so on. And that will be done, uh, you know, experimentally testing. Um, yeah. yeah, well, because I actually have a system which I can use in insect cells because there is no uh, glycosylation or so, but I can't do this in E. coli. So that's why I was interested in insect cells. Oh, I see. So yes, right. Okay, yeah, right. So it's the same reasoning that you were. But when you was it a uh, was it what sort of protein was it? Was it um, was it um, where was where was so it? it yeah, so it's a ubiquitinase. Oh, I see. So it's but, relevant to to mammalian systems. Um. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, so so, you, so then you have to. The risk is that the glycosylation might be different. I suppose. I, I think know. there's no glycosylation actually. Oh, there's no glycosylation. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, but oh. what happened? So, so what was your point that um, that you did it in? You didn't do it in coli. No, in so it's a bit too large in E. coli, so it's oh, going to be. Awesome, but... okay. okay. Yeah, and then maybe the last question, just out of curiosity, about the TTR. So the um, the structure which you showed in the with the small molecule. Uh, did you test also other small molecules? And did you see also this? Um... Sorry, I'm just going to. Uh, yeah. Uh, right, right, sorry. Uh, um, you mean at the very end? Uh, yes. Uh, when you show this connection with water. So if you saw it also in different small molecules with the TDR. You mean this bit? Um, no, I think the previous one, actually. Uh, this one. That one, oh, yes. So that, that's one of the drugs. And, and it has, TTR has two, 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 like, that's, the, that's the drug that is currently approved. It's called Tafamidis. And it, uh, the Tetramer has two binding sites. And this is a monovalent drug. And because there's some sort of negative cooperativity effect going on, when you put get one drug in, it tends to affect the other binding sites that nothing binds to it. And the idea of the new drug is, is that we are hopefully hitting both binding sites um, the, with one drug, so it goes across the gap and, and, and it bridges both binding sites. So the hope is that it would be better because of that reason. Um, 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 so is that, sorry, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I was just a bit confused about this. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense then? Yeah, I will read the paper as well. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay, thank you. All right. There is Yen. Yeah, hi, I had a question about the, the stealth nanodisks. Oh, yeah. Um, so I uh, kind of understood from the, um, from the example that they were used um, to crystallize membrane, membrane proteins, I'm assuming for um, like neutron crystallography, right? No, 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 they, no, no, it was never, never designed to go uh, to crystallography for us. So uh, it's like sands kind of. It, it's sands, exactly. Oh, so okay. so it, it's all low resolution solution scattering. It, it, 
I mean, actually, what's what's interesting? It's interesting that you say that because it, if you look at the, I'm going to show you go. Where am I going to go? If you, I really ought to have a list. Of, um, yeah. So um, if you look at those things, um, maybe it's yeah, yeah. If you look at these things there, um, just as they are, one of the nice. In, in, uh, there's different ways of doing this. There's another thing called smelts, right? The steering malic acid things. That's, but it, conceptually, um, they're difficult. I, I think, you know, the crystallization is, is probably quite difficult. But um, what does happen is that the, the disks that sometimes sit on top of each other and form extended structures, filaments. And of course, if you can line those up, you can get fiber diffraction data of. I mean, I have to give a, a, a talk tomorrow about fiber diffraction. Uh, so you can actually end up with filaments that you could conceivably study by fiber diffraction. But uh, certainly for, for, the, for the neutrons, I, I, I don't see crystallizing that being feasible. Okay. I mean, who knows? Never say never, but. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, that answers the, the, the rest of the question. <laughs> okay, thank you.